Good morning, church. Good, morning. Good to see you. I'd like to welcome you here to worship at Mill Creek. If you're joining us online, we say welcome to you as well. Some of you probably wondered, I was sitting up there with the singers, I'm not going to sing. So don't worry about that. Uh, after I pray, uh, after I pray in just a moment, we're going to uh, welcome Abby Rock up here to the stage. She's going to be talking to us about Love Life, the ministry that she's heading up here in the Roman Valley. And also want to draw your attention, uh, today is Pink Sunday. I think everyone pretty much got the memo. Good job. If you didn't have anything pink or you're looking for something pink to wear at the doors of the sanctuary and the fellowship hall, you can grab a pink room. It's just a, a way for us to honor those who are going through a cancer journey or remember those who have made, made it through their cancer journey. Would you join me in prayer? Father God, we thank you for this day. Lord, we rejoice. We are happy and glad. Because this is the day that you've made. We're grateful to be able to be here in your house this morning to fellowship together, to study your word, and to worship. Lord, we pray now at the beginning of this hour. Father, we pray that our songs of praise, our tithe and offering, and our listening to your word, our worship, would please you and honor you this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you all welcome Abby Ron? of a local ministry here in the Roanoke Valley called Love Life Roanoke. And um, I'm going to be sharing a little more in detail during the Sunday school hour. So I invite you guys to come um, to this back for like the first 20 minutes of uh, Sunday school. I'm going to share um, a little bit about what we do. Um, but what I want to just let you know is Love Life is a mi uh, uh, ministry um, that is uh, uniting and mobilizing the church to come around abortion vulnerable families to create a culture of love and life that will result in the end to abortion and the orphan crisis in our nation. And we do this in a really unique way. Um, we host 40 weeks of consecutive prayer walks um, through February through November, and we invite churches and pastors to adopt one of those weeks, and then we walk them through a four-step process. And so this week is Mill Creek's Adoption Week. Um, and we're going to walk you through that process. It's here, pray, go, and connect. So today I'm going to present to you the tragic truth of what's happening in our nation and what's happening in the Roanoke Valley. Um, and I'm going to invite you to, um, to participate with us this week in several different ways. One is on Wednesday. I'm going to invite you to pray. That's the second step of our adoption week. Pray. We're going to pray and fast around all things abortion. We're going to pray for the moms. We're going to pray for the dads. We're going to pray for the abortion workers. We're going to pray for the babies. Um, and so we're going to just spend time praying together. That's something you do on your own, um, however God leads you. Um, and then on Saturday, um, October 28th, we're going to invite you to go on a missions trip with us, a local missions trip. And so um, we will invite you to come out um, to the abortion clinic in Roanoke um, on Peters Creek Road. We actually meet at a church across the street from the um, abortion clinic. And we have a time of peaceful prayer. And I want to highlight that we are not protesting, we are not picketing, we're not holding signs. We are there to solely pray, um, and we are praying to bring an end to abortion in our nation. And so we invite you to come out and participate um, for that. And then at the end of that prayer walk, we have a time of connection, where we give you a time where you can individually connect with the ministry um, in different ways that you can um, serve um, or just get involved with the local ministry. And we're excited to be partnering with you guys this week. And like I said, I'll be sharing a little bit more with you um, in detail um, of what we do and how we do that during the Sunday school hour. So thank you. Thank you, Abby. Look forward to hearing that. You know what? Psalm 156, I mean, excuse me, 150, verse 6, says, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. I think that's all of us. And I don't hear any, let everything that has breath praise the Lord if you want to, or if you feel like it, or, eh, I don't know if I want to do it today. I think it's a command. So let's all stand and praise the Lord.
Dale?
for the past 15 months that I've been alone. The one person that I need, and the one thing I need to say, is a song that I love is my God. You are my way maker, my miracle worker, my promise keeper, and you are the light of this world. Every two minutes, a woman in the U.S. is diagnosed with breast cancer. One in eight women in the U.S. will be diagnosed with breast cancer in her lifetime. When called early, survival rates are the highest they've ever been. The average five-year survival rate for early breast cancer is up to 91%. So most of you here know who I am. For those of you online who don't know who I am, I'm so sweet. I'm the person who was on your prayer list starting July 14th and running through about the end of February or March of this year. My journey really started 20 years ago, and I'm going to share a short story about that to tell you where God has brought me in 20 years. My first journey started on Monday, November the 24th, the Monday after Thanksgiving. For four weeks of that year, Jerry and I were in and out of medical facilities with doctor's visits and testing. It was finding a good surgeon, a medical oncologist, a radiologist oncologist. Surgery was planned for December the 23rd, 2003. I hadn't even done shit Christmas shopping, and they wanted me to go ahead and think about even having surgery. So I say, can I just please wait till after Christmas? That was a no only because of the type of cancer that I had that was really, really aggressive. So they wanted me to get up on Sunday morning and say, I am cancer free. And I was able to do that. Surgery followed with four regular chemo treat chemotherapy treatments of adrenomycin. And for those of you who are in the medical field, and you know anything about the drug adrenomycin, it is a harsh drug to take. So with the aggressiveness of that type of cancer, they wanted to put me on four experimental treatments, and those I decided to do. Why would I not do it? It was out there. Other women needed, needed the results of what those tests would be. So those I did. I got through three of those, but not the fourth, but because the treatment was so harsh. Then came radiation again, 32 treatments, lab work, some weight gain, and then the lymphedema sent in, and they would deal with that. And I have to tell you that during that first 20 year trip, there were a couple of times I got really mad at God. And I said to him, Why in the world? I have too much to do, you know? And what have I done? What have I done that I would have to suffer? and I would have to go through these kind of treatments. Fast forward 20 years. In between all that time, we have several women here in our church who have also been diagnosed with breast cancer. Some treated with radiation, some with chemotherapy, and radiation, hair loss, and some had a mastectomy. Cancer is a personal journey for whoever takes it. It also affects your family. It also affects your church family. But it also affects your community, too. And the second diagnosis, I think Drew and I both can tell you, I knew. I just knew when I walked out of the mammogram, I knew what they were going to find, even though the doctors had already told me two weeks before that. I don't think it's anything at all. But you know, God just puts this feeling in you. Jesus. And you just know. So when the second time and when the second diagnosis came around, I guess we can probably say it was a real gut puncher, was it not true? We hit a wall and I knew somewhere I had to get around that wall that God had put up in front of me. And you know what? He reached down. And he took my hand. And he said to me, you're going to get through this. We're going to get through this. There's a plan. You just stay on the plan. 
and you continue to hold my hand as, help, as tight as you can hold it, and I'm going to get you through all of this. So, different type of cancer this time, more doctors, uh, and more testing. Through the second time around, we decided to do some genetic testing. Had we done that the first time 20 years ago, would I have gone through it the second time? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what God's plan was. And I think his plan just played out the way it should have played out. After four chemotherapy treatments this time, 16 radiation treatments, two surgery, I'm on my way to recovery. <laughs> and I thank Jesus for that. But there goes the notes. Here's what I need to say to you as a church, and I've been wanting to do this for many, many weeks, to so thank you for giving me the opportunity. It is all of you, and it was all of your prayers that helped us to walk through this journey. 5.30 in the morning, going in 5.81, I get a text, and it's from someone, and it says, I've already been out this morning praying for you. You got this. God's got it, because we got you wrapped in prayer, sitting in a treatment chair. I get a text. First time they want to put the medicine through the port, and I am scared to death. I am holding on to my prayer blanket as hard as I can hold on to it. God says, we got this. And the peace and the calm comes over. But the text says, I'm not sure <clears throat> when today, you would have your treatment. But I want you to know, I've been praying for you. And God's got this. And you got this. So, as a church, keep on praying. Keep on praying. Prayer is so important. The prayer blankets that we pray over, you don't know what they mean to someone who receives it. But you also receive your blessing too. Little children up here this morning are praying. Oh my, we are doing wonderful things here. Wonderful things in the church. And so from the bottom of my heart, and I know from those who have gone through breast cancer, who are going through breast cancer, those who have given their life, they say thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your support. Thank you for the cards. Thank you for the meals that you provide. But just thank you for just being who you are. Thank you. Men aren't exempt from breast cancer either, though a smaller yes. percentage. That is true. Men aren't. And if you have any questions about genetic testing, you can ask Sue or you can ask me. It's a simple process that can bring you lots of answers. Sue, thank you. Let me have my word of welcome to those of you here as well as those of you joining us online this morning. We are going to enter into our time of prayer this morning. As I looked over our prayer list this morning, I counted 15 different people on our list who are walking through cancer at this moment. That's just on our list. That's our family and friends. And we have all been touched by cancer in some form or fashion. And so I want to uh, just remind you, we do call today to reflect, to remember, to pray. Last week we talked about, give us this day our daily bread. We talked about needs and praying for it, not just our needs, but other people's needs. And Sue just gives testimony about how God uses those prayers to help meet somebody else's daily needs. So thank you for that. Our person of prayer for this week, as I pulled the name out of the jar, is Cindy Hayden. <laughs> I said, uh, Cindy is one who has been down that journey herself, and so it, it did not shock me when her name came out of the jar this morning. Pray for Cindy uh, this week. Also, um, I want to pray for Love Life Ministries. I had the opportunity to participate in a pastor walk back in May and was deeply touched by um, what Love Life is doing. So I'm glad that some of our Sunday school classes have picked that mantle up and um, are encouraging us. We do, I want to encourage you. We talk about sanctity and human life every January. This is an opportunity to put some feet to our thoughts and to our 
um, what we stand behind. Um, and so just want to uh, lift up Love Life as well. Last week in our second hour, we had a prayer blanket for June Keith, and um, it was timely. June went to be with the Lord yesterday morning, and she received that prayer blanket last Monday. And so remember the Keith family as they uh, mourn June's passing, but also celebrate her life this coming week. And uh, there are a host of others on our prayer sheet that I know are, um, are counting on you to pray. Our family began a journey this past week with our granddaughter Grace. And I just want to say thank you for your prayers. Thank you for the many ways in which you have reached out to Josh and to Rachel, as well as to um, Debbie and I this week. And they are greatly appreciative of your prayers. Grace is doing well. She's home. She's going to be here later on. She's going to be here later on. She's going to wait to get back to church. And so uh, it's a new, new normal, new lifestyle with um, type 1 diabetes in uh, her body. And so, again, we just thank you for continuing to pray for her and the family as um, they transition and learn what this looks like. Having grown up in a home where my dad was diagnosed with juvenile diabetes, I understand from one side what that's like. And so we do come to prayers with that. And thank you for your prayers this week. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, as we do come before you this morning, Father, we come recognizing that cancer is a part of this ugly, sin fallen world. Lord, we do know there is coming a day when cancer will be no more. We do know there is coming a day when tears and pain and sorrows will be no more. But until that day, here we are. And so, Lord, we come before you, the giver, the creator, the sustainer of life. We come before you, the great physician, thanking you for healing on this side of eternity, as well as for healing on the other side. Father, cancer is one of those things that touches each one of us, not just breast cancer. Lord, there are so many types of cancer out there, so many people who are fighting and battling even now, and we lift them up to you. These are our prayer list, Lord, who all are dealing with cancer. Father, we pray for them. Father, I thank you for Cindy. I thank you for her ministry here. I thank you for her receiving genetic testing for the, um, the route that, that she and Philip chose to go so that she could remain healthy. Lord, we thank you for testimonies like Sue's that remind us of your healing. And Father, we also thank you for the testimony that reminds us of our call to pray for others, especially when they're journeying through difficult times. And so, Lord, we do just that. Father, we thank you for Love Life. We thank you for Abby, for her calling to this ministry. We pray, Lord, that as we go through this week, Father, as atrocities fill our minds through the nightly news of infants and children being killed in times of war, we are reminded that they're being killed right here before they even have a chance to live. And so, Father, help us. Help us to take that seriously. Lord, help us to have a desire to pray to end abortion here in this country. Father, we come before you right now lifting those others up on the prayer list who are dealing with a variety of other things right now. Some, like the Keith family, like Philip um, Simmons and his family who have experienced loss this week, and others, Lord, we pray for comfort as they journey in this valley of grief. Father, for us, as we continue to worship and prepare to look into your word, Lord, open our hearts to be receptive to what you share. And Father, even now, as we give our tithes and offerings this morning, we pray your blessings upon them as we send them out, not just to do ministry here, but as we send those offerings out, to accomplish your work, your kingdom work around this world, Lord, we pray you bless it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Just as we are called to go to God with our daily needs to supply our physical needs, we're called to God to go to Him with our spiritual needs as well. We're called to go to Him for forgiveness of our sin. Our physical body needs to be nourished on a daily basis through food. Our spiritual body needs to be renewed daily through repentance and forgiveness by confession and cleansing. And when we have spent time in God's presence, recognizing him as our loving, heavenly, compassionate father, he is a compassionate king, he is the one, he is, he's the king of this kingdom, and we talked about our hearts being the king, being the throne room of our lives, who is on the throne of our hearts. When we go to him as our great provider, give us this day our daily bread, then our heart, then our mind, then our spirit have been placed in a right position to enter into this next opportunity of prayer, to confront the sin in our life, to come before him now as our Redeemer. I've got news for you. Jesus said, this then is how you should pray. Forgive our debts. <laughs> Forgive our debts. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. You've got a sin problem. Hello. I've got a sin problem. There was an Andy Griffith show where Barney says, I've got a uvula, you've got a uvula, all God's children got uvulas. <laughs> Shows you how the spirit works, that's not in my notes. <laughs> I've got a sin problem, you've got a sin problem, all God's children. You've got a sin problem. Look at your neighbor and say, you, you got a sin problem. <laughs> How's that feel? <laughs> Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. We all got a sin problem. Romans 6.23 begins with, the wages of sin is death. death. We all have a sin debt. We all have a sin debt that we are all incapable of paying. That's a problem. There's absolutely nothing I can do to pay off my debt. There's absolutely nothing you can do to pay off your debt. Why? Because it's already been paid off. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Sin is ugly. My mortgage is ugly. <laughs> My car payment is ugly. My student loans, oh Lord, they're ugly. <laughs> Especially now that I gotta start paying on them. <laughs> Sin is ugly, as all debt is. Sin holds us in bondage like a spider's web holds its prey. It holds us in the bondage of guilt and shame. And as a result, it keeps us from the Father. We can try to deny our sin. We can try to ignore our sin. We can try to excuse it. We can try to hide it. But its reality continues to be painfully present in my life. I've got to deal with it. I've said it before and I will say it again. Sin will take us farther than we ever dreamed of going, and it will keep us there longer than we ever imagined staying. Because we want to ignore it. We don't want to deal with it. We want to pretend it doesn't exist. Satan uses our sin to keep us away from God. Satan will use our sin to keep us away from church and God's people. We don't want to be anywhere near anybody or anything that the Holy Spirit will use to convict us of our sin. It makes us feel bad. And so it's not uncommon for me to be talking to somebody and, and church comes up. And I'll say, man, what? have you been going to church? Have you been in God's word? No. Every time I go, I just feel bad. <laughs> That's because you've got a problem that you can't deal with on your own. 
You're a sinner. Satan uses that sin. He whispers in our ear to keep us away from anything in which the Holy Spirit would seek to convict us. And as a result of his whispering in our ear, we're afraid to go to the Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. You forgive us. What did Paul say? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's already been taken care of, but Satan tries to keep us away from experiencing the joy and the peace that comes through forgiveness. Some translations use the word debt. Some use sin. Forgive us our sins. Well, very early ones. I got to think about this this past week. I said, why do we say forgive us our trespasses? I haven't found a Bible yet in my office that says that. And what I discovered was one of the earliest manuscripts back in the 15, one of the earliest Bibles that Tyndale printed back in the, the mid-1500s, Tyndale um, uh, uh, took that Greek word and put trespasses in there because it was fitting at that time, but it's not, we don't think of it in the same way today. And then the Common Book of Prayer picked it up, but since the late 1500s, early 1600s, it's not been in a Bible. That goes to show you how often we just accept something and take run off with it. Really, the word debts is probably the most appropriate word to use here. So the question is, why did Jesus use the word debt in the prayer as opposed to others? I believe, I believe it's because our sin not only has an effect on us, typically our sin affects somebody or someone else. And so we have brought somebody, it's a debt. We have included somebody else in. When we pray, forgive us our debts, we're praying, forgive me for what I've done and the consequence of it is saying, Lord, forgive me for what I've done. Forgive me for the harm that I've caused. Forgive me for the hurt, for the pain that I put onto somebody else. Forgive me for the distrust. Forgive me for the damage that I've caused to... And then insert whatever name you need to insert there. When we pray, forgive us our debts, we're admitting our sin. Now, you know me. I am not a prosperity gospel proponent. Except for right here. Because... The only prosperity gospel you're going to hear me ever promote is this. If you will confess your sin, if you will name it and claim it, you will receive forgiveness and live. That's the prosperity gospel. Name it and claim it and receive forgiveness. Right there. When we pray forgive us of our debts, we're admitting our sin. We're acknowledging that we've done things, that we've said things, that we've thought things, or that we haven't done, haven't said, haven't thought, like I shared about my story in sixth grade with Kim recently, that we should have done. When we name it, we are accepting responsibility for our actions before holy God. Why do you think the Lord has us pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, before we get to this point? Well, if you think back, praying your kingdom come, your will be done is our submitting to his authority and his will, God's rules in our life. This is his kingdom. He makes the rules. So having just prayed and recommitted to that, we are now applying what is probably the most self-disclosing, self-revealing prayer there is. We're saying, God, this is your kingdom. And you hate sin. And I've got to confess, I'm a sinner. God, I've got to come clean. I've got to make things right with you. I've got to make things right with those around me that I've hurt. I've got to make things right with those that I've judged. I've got to make things right with those whom I've taken advantage of and whatever else that you need to, you need to make right. But remember, this is a bullet point. It's meant to take us to some points. So when we pray, forgive us our debts, the word debt should bring to mind specific sin or sins that we're asking forgiveness for. Don't just blank it. Don't just forgive me of my sins and move on. Spend the time 
admitting, confessing those sins and seeking forgiveness. When we seek forgiveness for a specific sin, we're beginning the process. And trust me, forgiveness is a process. We're beginning the process of forgiveness. 2 Corinthians 7.10 tells us godly sorrow brings repentance. By definition, repentance means to turn away from. And so when I repent from my sin, I'm turning away from it. And, well, in this case, I'm looking right at the cross. Uh -oh. I'm looking right at Jesus. I'm looking right at the one who took that sin debt on my behalf. I can't pay it because he already did. Godly sorrow means that our heart breaks for what breaks God's heart. Holding on to the debt holds us back in our walk with God. David's prayer in Psalm 51, man, look it up later on. David's prayer in Psalm 51 is a prayer of godly sorrow and repentance. You get to Luke, in Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son came back as a result of godly sorrow and repentance in his life. I have messed up so bad, Dad, I just want to be one of your servants. That's godly sorrow and repentance. There's a huge difference between someone who expresses godly sorrow and someone who's just sorry because they got caught. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow, mm, sorry I got caught, worldly sorrow, Paul wrote, brings death. Someone who is sorry they got caught experiences a worldly sorrow that doesn't lead to true godly repentance. It continues to drive that wedge between them and their Heavenly Father. Understand this. When we sin, God does not stop loving us. There is nothing you can do to make God stop loving you more than he does at this very moment. But that sin drives a wedge. It separates our relationship with God it begins to draw us away from him, like I said earlier. So Jesus calls us to pray for forgiveness, to remove the wedge of guilt and shame that is between us and the Father. Seeking forgiveness from the debt deepens our dependency on God and draws us back into a right relationship with him. Seeking does an amazing job in our life. But remember, this is a corporate prayer as well as an individual <coughs> prayer. We need not only confess our individual debts and sins, but also lift the debts and sins of others up to God for forgiveness. You're like, what? Well, just think back to Moses. He lifted up the sins of the people to God. Nehemiah, Isaiah, even Jesus prayed, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. We are called to pray for our debts. Why? Because we sin individually. We sin communally. Folks, we need to be on our knees praying for this nation. We need to be on our knees praying for the sins of this nation. We need to be on our knees praying for the direction that this nation is headed. We need to be on our knees praying, seeking God for forgiveness. This Wednesday, take time to fast and pray for love life and for the ministry that's going on there. We need to be praying for... Why is it pictures can disturb us so badly of children and infants being killed? But what's happening down the street doesn't bother us. We need to pray. We all sin. We all need forgiveness. And wouldn't it be great if Jesus stopped right there? But he did. We all need to forgive those who sin against us. See, here's the part most of us want to skip over. 
We're okay with the part where we praise God for who he is, our Heavenly Father. We're good with the part where we recognize he's in charge and pray for his will. That, that's, that's cool. We really like, we really like this, the part about praying for stuff we need. Oh, Lord, help me out here with my daily deeds. But can't we just skip over this part? I mean, it'd even be fine if, if we went praying for our sins. I, I, I'm, I'm good with that. But then Jesus got to step on the toes. And what's he saying? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. The second part of verse 12 <coughs> is so important that Jesus has an appendix to it. You know how sometimes when you read the book it says, see appendix, blah, 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 for further will. Look at verse 14 and 15 of chapter 6. It seems like Jesus has ended the prayer, but then he says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you, but if you do not forgive others, their sins... Can, can we stop right there? Your Father will not forgive your sins. Now this can be confusing to a lot of people. It can cause them to wonder, okay, so am I really, am I really saved if I can't forgive people for the sins they've committed against me? I mean, if I don't forgive others, then, then I must not be saved because Jesus, well, Jesus was not saying that we earn our salvation. He wasn't saying that you earn salvation by forgiving others. That would completely conflict with the whole process of mercy and grace that he extends to us. I think part of the reason we find it difficult to forgive others is because they've hurt us. It's not just we've hurt God. It's not just we've hurt others. Now, we've been hurt. And trust me, I know that for some of you, that hurt is still fresh. It may be 30, 40, 50 years old, and it's still as fresh as the day that it happened. I, I understand that. I went back and looked. It was two years ago, right at this time, where we spent a couple of weeks working on forgiveness and what that looks like. So whether you have been hurt physically or emotionally, that pain is real. And we need to pray about it. It was a little later on in Matthew 18, 21 to 35, where Jesus goes into more detail about what it looks like to forgive other people when he tells the parable of the unmerciful servant. Basically, the parable goes something like this. A guy owed the king over $10 million. The king called into account that, that debt, and the guy came groveling before the king, please, please, I can't, but I will work every day of my life to repay. He doesn't have enough lifetime to repay a $10 million debt. It, it was exorbitant, and what Jesus, the point Jesus was making is there is no way that guy could have ever worked that debt off. There's no way you can ever work off the sin debt in your life. And in the parable, the king forgives the servant the entire debt and sends him on his way. Talk about a load lifted. Man. And as he's on his way, he encounters a fellow servant who owes him like $5,000. And he calls the servant into account. The servant can't pay. So what's he do? He throws him in jail. Word gets back to the king. And the king calls this guy back in, and now he is a wicked servant. I forgave you of all of your debt, and you're not willing to forgive him of that little bit? And some of you right now are going, Danny, the, the debt that they owe me is not little. Well, 
That's because you and I put sin on grade levels. God does not. Sin is right here. They, they, they all are on the same line. Whether you took something that you knew belonged to somebody else. I'll never forget the guilt I felt the first time I walked home with a church pen in my pocket. <laughs> I'm like, I wish I had a key to the church. I need to return this now. Sin is sin in God's eyes. It's a debt that we are incapable of paying. The servant didn't deserve the forgiveness. It was an act of love, mercy, and grace on the part of the king. And so what Jesus was acknowledging is that when people hurt you, when you have suffered it in some way, what he's saying is, I understand that pain. I understand the pain you felt because of the pain your sin has caused me. I understand the pain you're feeling because of that pain I feel as a result of the sin that has hurt you. I get it. I understand it. I died for all of them. He's saying, I forgave you of all your sins. So if you're my follower, you need to get, forgive those who have hurt you. You need to forgive those who have sinned against you. I think what Jesus is saying is that if we have truly experienced God's forgiveness, if we truly look back and remember what it is like to receive forgiveness for our sins, we can't help but forgive other people for how they wronged us. In verse 15, Jesus stresses that if we can't forgive and be reconciled on the human level, how can we accept? to be reconciled to God on the spiritual level. Jesus is stressing that an attitude of unforgiveness is incompatible with our calling ourselves a Christian. It's why Paul wrote in Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you. And in Colossians 3.13, bear with each other, forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. If we say that we're going to come under his authority, if we say that we are going to live by his kingdom rules, then we also need to cancel the debt that others have on us. Just as Jesus has canceled our Debt. Jesus knew that his disciples would need forgiveness every day. Jesus knew that his disciples would need to offer forgiveness every day. God has forgiven you. God has forgiven me. Can I forgive others on my own? No. But can I forgive others with God's help? Yes. With God's help, I can forgive myself as well as others who sin against me. And when we do, remember how this prayer just continues to interweave itself. <clears throat> when we forgive, when we are forgiven, we begin to experience joy and peace. When we forgive, we continue to experience <clears throat> joy and peace on earth as it is in heaven. Father, remind us that prayer often is tough. Remind us that we're not called simply to pray this prayer verbatim and move on. You're calling us to allow each bullet to sink in and motivate and move us into a deeper relationship, a deeper response with you. So, Father, even now, help us as we chew on this last statement of forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you've never experienced the forgiveness that comes from your debt being canceled, that sin debt being canceled, I want, to, I want to be able to share that with you today. If you'd like to know more about what it means to ask Jesus in your heart to seek that forgiveness, I'd love to have that conversation here, online, and that could be later. If you'd like to make that decision today as we sing, I'll be right here. 
maybe the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you this morning. And as a result of this series that we've been walking through with this prayer, the Spirit's been nudging you, and you just know you need to respond to whatever it is the Spirit's leading. You can do that. If you'd like to know more about becoming part of the Milk Creek family, we'd love to share that with you. We're going to close this hour of worship out by standing and singing a song. It's an opportunity to worship. It's an opportunity to respond. You do whatever is right for you in this moment. Let's stand together.